see everybody else. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our session titled 360 Degree View of Inclusive Insurance and the Linkages with Social Protection. Um, we're in football season, and if you recall my um, Ignite on, on, on Monday, um, we, we linked, in a way, what we're doing with, with football, right? So um, I saw this quote from Neymar, and I thought it was really interesting. There is no pressure when you're making a dream come true. And I think if we walk around the halls of this space, you see all of these little sayings. And I think each of us, in our own way, are doing what we can with what we have. And I'm taking that from Mary, my colleague from the bank, Countries do what they can with what they have to try to make a more sustainable future. So today, with the creative thinking of many people, um, we have come up through the work of organizations like the World Bank, the United Nations, about this link between financial protection and, and sorry, insurance and for financial protection mechanisms and insurance and scaling up insurance so that it reaches the most vulnerable in our population. And one of the things I like to say, I'm from the Caribbean, and there are some Caribbean countries that are pretty, you know, there are high levels of poverty in many parts of the world. And we have issue, um, natural disasters, hazards that impact people. And then, you know, we're here talking about insurance and you know, insurance for the most vulnerable. But the truth is, if you had a choice between buying chicken and feeding your family, would you buy chicken or insurance? You'd buy chicken, right? Yeah, I'd buy chicken if I, if, if I, you know. So then how do we get these mechanisms, these insurance instruments? How do we protect lives and livelihoods? And it's not about, um, you know, we can just take off subsidies or, you know, the truth is a lot of poor people can't afford insurance. So we have to come up with mechanisms to help them protect their lives and livelihoods. And they do have a strong interest. I remember Gina and myself meeting with some fishermen in Jamaica. And basically they said, we will buy livelihood insurance. We're not buying life insurance because we want to protect our livelihoods. So welcome to our panel today in which we have five panelists who will be working with us, who will be sharing with you this morning different ways of, different types of insurance at the macro, meso, micro levels and different ways in which they are working to scale up access to insurance. So without much further ado, I am going to welcome my panel and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and in one line they're experts with what they do so we do not need to know everything about them just in one sentence who you are I am Isabel from Brazil and I work in C3 reinsurance company Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Gina Sangonetti Phillips, and I work with CRIF SPC. I hail originally from Jamaica, and I'm very pleased to be here this morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rajan Azarudin. I'm working with Munich Climate Insurance Initiative, based in Germany. Thank you. Okay, and I'm going to ask our two panelists online, Flavio and Jorge, to introduce themselves. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Flavia Lorenzon, and I work for the regional office of the World Food Program covering Latin America and Caribbean uh, in social protection. And Jorge? Good morning. My name is Jorge Arrientos. I'm from Guatemala. I work for the World Food Program uh, in the Guatemalan country office, but also for the regional bureau in um, uh, respondents and life insurance. 
Thank you. And just as I welcome you, our audience, I would also like to welcome Jada and Arista, who are viewing us online. They have their young young people and they are interns. They have been interns with CRIF and we invited them with our extra tickets to attend the conference. So they have been around looking at different aspects of the conference. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do this morning is that we're going to step back. You know, sometimes to get to where you want to go, you have to step back to go forward. And what we're going to do is that we're going to play a two-minute video. This was three years ago in 2019, and it was understanding risk. Can we see these images repeating itself? And this is our point of departure on this particular panel. So let's go back to UR 2019. Um, For people who survive these things, yeah, kind it's kind of like grief that you never really forget. Coming back here to this place I once called home and knowing what I went through that night, it really taking a toll on my life. I when I looked on my farm, I did not see anything but earth. You know, I say, I say, Lord, I don't have nothing left. You know. I'm sorry. It wasn't that prepared, and when that hurricane hit was just pure disaster. After Maria and the fishing community, everything was on a standstill, dead. When the volcano erupted, I really thought it would just go back to sleep. The, the noise, the, the, the wildness of it, the awe of it is so absolutely terrifying. A tropical storm carrying winds of less than 40 miles would normally in the past not been seen as something dangerous. However, that tropical storm carrying 10 inches of rain dropping in two hours is as catastrophic as a hurricane freak. These things are going to keep happening in the Caribbean. Uh, we have a number of perils, uh, the hurricanes, which is what we're known for. But we saw what happened with the earthquake in Haiti. We've got tsunamis, which really hasn't affected us that much. But that's a strong likelihood. It's something my father used to say all the time there but for the grace of God go I. So it will be Dominica's turn or Jamaica's turn or Montserrat's turn. At some point, we're so vulnerable. All right, so we, we cut it there. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna ask each of our panelists, what if we face similar hazards again? And we know it's gonna happen. How do each of you connect with that video, with that video called Voices of Resilience? And what we are asking, what I'm asking them to share with you this morning is to discuss the work that they're doing in Latin America and the Caribbean around insurance for disaster risk and how it is contributing to reducing vulnerability, enhancing resilience. And for some of our panelists, they will actually focus on that link with insurance and social protection. For some of our panelists, the focus is really going to be on how are we getting to the most vulnerable? How are we protecting their lives and their livelihoods in the face of a changing climate? So each will speak for five minutes on the topic. And I will start off with Isabel. Bon dia. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. And please feel free to walk okay. if you wish so you Thank can connect. You. <laughs> As a reinsurance company, um, our core business is risk analysis. So three is a reinsurance company, and we apply deep knowledge, intelligent data, and capital strength 
to anticipate and manage risks in order to better understand the exposure and modeling these risks to provide reinsurance capacity to the insurance market, which means cover protection through the public and private sectors. And watching this video and look around today specifically, we can see and we can feel how climate change is one of the biggest risks for our society. The global economy is facing its effects by seeing extreme weather events with more intensity, with more frequency, and confirm the trend that we, Swiss Re, have observed over the last five years that secondary perils, the consequence of big events, are driving insurance losses in several locations. And these perils are intensified by some effect, effects, like for some, some situations like rapid urbanization, mainly in vulnerable areas, consumption habits, deforestation, pollution, and loss of biodiversity, and so on. 75% of all natural catastrophes are still uninsured, and we see large protection gaps globally. Swiss Re works through different channels and, uh, and offer insurance protection solutions to different lines of business, for example, agriculture, net, uh, life and health, engineering, infrastructure. But I would like to highlight here the partnership with public sector solution. We have a public sector solution teams in several locations working together with public sector developing different types of solutions that requires, for example, massive protection, reliable sources, fast indemnities, using technology, and mainly tailor-made solutions based on a predefined budget in order to create a more robust line of defense for governments in emergency situations. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. And we will come back to you later on to discuss how just some examples of where this is being applied. I will now move on to Gina to again address the same questions. If how, how, how are you connecting with this particular video? And what are you doing in the Caribbean at CRIF SPC? Thanks, Liz. Um, she asked us to reflect on the video. And of course, the ex events such as these have continued since 2019. We had in 2020, we had um, hurricanes, Iota, Zeta, Eta, as we ran out of regular names and had to go to the Greek alphabet that year because we had so many hurricanes. Uh, we also had the 7.2 earthquake in Haiti as well. Of course, that's not related to climate change. And then those of us in Saint, or near to St. Vincent recall that there was the eruption of the La Soufriere volcano. So we've had a very busy few years in the Caribbean and Central America. And those are the two regions that CRIF um, has members in. So CRIF provides uh, parametric insurance products for tropical cyclones, for earthquakes, for excess rainfall to governments in the Caribbean and Central America. And we also provide coverage specifically for the fisheries sector in those countries, as well as for electric utilities. Um, and those are, direct, those are purchased directly by the electric utility companies themselves, whereas the other products are purchased by the government. Um, so we are intimately involved in supporting our member governments, and we look forward to sharing with you a little bit later on in the panel about how we link what we do to countries' uh, social protection systems. All right. Thank you, Gina. And I think I'm going to ask you a question from now to think about how payouts made by CRIF can be aligned to social protection and how they have been used to support the most vulnerable. Because oftentimes, you know, we do hear, and I'm also at CRIF, but we do hear that, you know, what are the payouts used for? It, you know, there is this notion that a government gets the payout, but then the payout does go to persons. So we're going to be looking at that a little bit. But let us go on to, to um, our online 
panelists. And I think that's Jorge, Jorge Barrientos from World Food Program. Jorge, responding to the same questions, the video and the work you're doing at World Food Program. Thank you. Um, well, watching the video connects me on, to, on what's happening as WFP and also what WFP is doing within our communities. Um, it is a reality, and we all know that climate risks have increased in 2022. Right. And, um, and the year in 2022 was not a stranger to these disasters. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. So, um, only in Guatemala, WFP issued more than 13,000 payouts uh, during this rain season. Um, so, raising the awareness and also Make it, making sure that the, that the right tools are within whenever uh, within the communities whenever something happens is something that we need to work with. But the part of the video which I identify more is the work that is related um, to what we do. And when, when, when they're sharing that part in, in which we need to create awareness uh, at a community level and then we, we're living different times, that's one of the things that I was related to the video. Because, so, we need to take responsibility and stop all these activities that are not helping us confront these events. And that's what is the, the social protection, but also the resilient activities that we're doing within our regions and communities uh, as that we feel working with. So we're teaching the communities to confront this, um, this risks, but also giving them the right tools into changing the way they do things into making them more smart in terms of how they're producing, um, to raise the awareness of we need to stop uh, cutting trees, we need to change the ways that we're producing food, uh, we need to change the way we're spending money as well in financial education parts. Um, and that will create a more resilient community, but also will move into a more resilient country uh, that will prevent and confront these events. We know that COP27 will uh, it's raising this uh, government awareness of what we need to do, but also we need to focus ourselves, as WFP is doing, is how to raise the community awareness and then work together towards a long-term change of risk reduction. Um, therefore, the integration to, of insurance schemes into the resilient activities uh, is what we do, is what we need to think about it. It's not a, it's not a standalone solution just having an insurance perspective, but uh, having it in the resilient activities is the holistic approach that we're doing. And that's what we're doing within the region in Central America, but also uh, the Caribbean. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Um, we will now go on to Raja Nazaruddin from the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative, um, where they're working on some really exciting projects around inclusive insurance, both in the Caribbean and in the Pacific. And he's going to share those experiences and the difficulties that they will be confronting whilst connecting with the video. Thanks a lot, Liz. Um, thank you. Um, Munich Climate Insurance Initiative is uh, a think tank, non-profit think tank based in Germany. Um, the initiative is formed by a um, group of insurance companies and uh, research institutions and also NGO to see a solution um, for climate risk um, disaster finance and insurance. So uh, we are uh, being hosted at UN universities in Bonn, the Institute for Environment and Human Securities. So we are based in Bonn um, and uh, we work on uh, policies, uh, climate analytic, and also uh, implementing the solutions in right now, we are implementing one in the Caribbean and also in the Pacific as uh, Liz just mentioned. So um, in um, our work, I mean, related to video Liz, what I see is our work is to provide um, a solution for um, uh, low income and vulnerables. So th this vulnerability is the main work of uh, MCIIs. And so we work on the policy and, and the risk analytic and also the implementation. And um, currently we have two projects on the solutions uh, implementations, one in the Caribbean, which we work together 
with um, CRIF SPC. And in the Pacific, we have one project also solution for parametric insulin, micro insulin. We work together with United Nations um, Capital Development Fund, UNCDF. Um, which working with different countries, including Fiji. Um, one colleague from Fiji was um, uh, sharing a, a very interesting session yesterday on um, uh, gender budgeting, but include on disaster risk management. So one important thing that is uh, for our work is a collaboration with the local um, uh, partners, because we are based in, in Germany, and uh, local partners is the one who understand more about the risk, how is local risk. And I think that is more important when we come to develop um, um, a tailored solutions, the region would be different, the, re, um, the hazard would be different, right? And then the exposure would be different. And, um, and these are linking to uh, social protections. Um, at, the, at the Pacific, um, the project is now collaborating with the um, World Food Program and together with government of Fiji and so we are piloting uh, shock responses, social protection programs. So from these product, we see how um, innovative approach is not only to bring a product based on satellite data, for example, to make it accuracy products, but also to see how the innovation part on providing access to low income and vulnerable community to have access on um, um, financial services. Um, I think I will stop there. Right, because yeah. you have, we, have another, we have another round to go. I'm now going to ask our final panelist, Flavia, in this round to, to, to bring her, her thoughts to the table on the video as well as to connect with the work that she is currently doing also from the World Food Program. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so the video that we watch, uh, the Voices of Resilience, correct? Um, if you would think about it, the people affected when this major events, major disasters occur, they are both people that were already in a situation of vulnerability, but there are also people that uh, had jobs uh, and lost their livelihoods. So I think what we can see here is there are some types of shocks that um, impact um, po populations in a very similar manner, obviously depending on the level of vulnerability that each household has already. So what I'm trying to say here is something that we connect because our um, the work of social protection, um, it's it, obviously um, uh, universal within countries. Uh, and although most of the people benefiting from social protection are the ones that are most vulnerable, we are all uh, in a universal manner, eligible to that, depending on the circumstances of our lives. So here we see the key importance of social protection. And through the World Food Program, uh, we support government, so we don't uh, act uh, on our own, uh, especially in Latin America. Our governments are very strong and have uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, sorry. They have mature systems of social protection, so we support the systems to, um, uh, to to strengthen some parts of the system and to be more shock responsive to shocks. And there is a, a very important um, overlap between vulnerability and uh, food insecurity and also vulnerability in terms monetary terms, but also in terms of shocks and weather related shocks. Like for example, it, just in, in, in our region, uh, since 2019, um, the food and nutrition security increased by almost 20%. And at the same time, we saw, uh, we've been seeing an increase on the impact of some weather-related shocks. So we can already predict that people that are in a food and, uh, food and nutrition insecure situation will be uh, proportionally more affected by the shocks too. Um, and... The, the World Food Program, as I said, supporting the governments, trying to um, um, strengthen the social protection systems to have these objectives. We work a lot with institutions like CRIF that we have here, and I think I'm going to touch upon this later in some examples that we have of microinsurance in the Caribbean and Central America um, uh, through CRIF and that activate uh, a shock responsive system that can be very effective and quick in responding um, to these major shocks and helping uh, the affected people uh, 
to have the means to bounce back faster. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Flavia. And before we go into round two, um, you know, this conference is organized. What if, what now, what next? So before we get into the what next, I want to hear from you. Is there any question that you would like to ask any of our panelists before we move on? Or is there something that you've heard that you want to get into a little more at this point? Or something that you think you should have heard based on your own experiences? So anyone? Yes, the panel, we multi, yes, go ahead. Hello. Um, and introduce yourself, tell us where you're from so that. Hello, I'm, I'm Narissa from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, um, and I work with the economic planning. Um, I'm feeding off of your opening statement about the chicken and insurance. And um, how do we um, get rid of the mistrust that there is? Because persons would have, and I've known it personally, purchase, let's say it's, I know we, we're focusing on insurance that is a package for the government or for institutions, but let's talk about private where you would have had insurance for, for what, a hurricane, only to find out that your package does not, it doesn't cover flooding, so you're not covered. Or for disasters, only to find out that it doesn't cover destruction by ash i mean how do you get rid of that mistrust or that that it was created you know and we, we we know that is that is very common okay so i will hazard a guess and then i will um go over to my panelists and i think for many of us we just don't understand insurance the most brilliant of us we just do not understand and the other thing that i think that is that we're at fault at at one level is that we buy things and we don't know what we're buying so how many of you have bought something and the agent just says sign here so we go to pick up or, or, or simple we're going on we're going on an airline and american airlines has all of these things now attestation form everything and we just sign we don't know what we're signing to so that's the first thing but secondly Insurance companies also need to go deeper in terms of building capacity, sharing information, but we also need to be responsible and consumer affairs commissions also need to do some work because yes, they, talk, they, they are there for things like different consumer-based items, but we rarely hear them speaking about things like insurance. So I think education is key, capacity building is key, and our insurance companies, they also need to know, we're talking about inclusive insurance, but the truth is we are now educating our insurance companies to be inclusive because they don't understand how to relate to certain groups of people. But I'm gonna throw this out to any of our panelists here that would like to say something on, 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 the, on the topic. Go ahead, anybody. Um, I'd like to point out, we haven't really discussed it at all, but CRIF does provide what we call parametric insurance. And one of the key things in parametric insurance is that it's triggered automatically due to um, you know, the intensity of natural hazard events. So you can see, you can feel those. And when you're purchasing the policies and the micro insurance policies that um, MCI and CRIF are working on together are for individuals. So those are at the individual level to supplement anything that they might get from the government. And in selling those policies to low income persons, a big part of it is the awareness raising and increasing understanding so that they understand what they're buying, what is likely to trigger it, and the communication is directly to them. You know, by, they get a text message, they don't have to file a claim, they don't have to go through the insurance company. So that's a big part of making sure they understand what, what they're buying. Thank you, Gino. Uh, interesting that you mentioned flood because it's exactly the second peril that I have mentioned because it's the consequence of one event. And for insurance and reinsurance, one very important information is data. We need to have data in order to modeling into 
create a proper that make a product that makes sense not only for private but also for the public sector as well. And reinsurers are trying to figure it out what kind of product makes sense thinking about in a massive protection, wrapped indemnization. And that's why it's important, these connections between the insurance market and public sector solutions, because the, the bill always will be with the public sector and we need to improve this um, penetration, insurance penetration. Okay, thank you, Isabel. Before we, Roger, you respond, I'll ask our online panelists, Flavio Jorge, do you want to add? Do you want to add to what's being discussed? Flavio, I see you shake your head. Yeah, yeah I think Jorge also wants to add, but I just wanted to say that alluding to the title of the session, uh, 360 degree, that's why it's important for us to have these discussions on risk layering, that we have different instruments that could be suitable for different, uh, different kinds of shocks. So when we talk about parametric insurance uh, at a macro level with the activation of shock responsive social protection, obviously we are mostly referring to big events, but that does not mean that social protection could not be activated um, in smaller events. And that's actually what many countries are moving towards that you have concentrated floodings or, uh, or even a drought in certain areas and the, the person affected themselves, uh, they can claim uh, a benefit from the government. So I just wanted to complement that part of the public sector that definitely it's important that public and, and private sector work together on that. Uh, but I just wanted to allude to the risk layering. Jorge? Thank you, Flavia. Um, I, do, I, I, do really, I really like the question. And, um, and I, I do agree with you in terms of we need to do better education in terms of financial education when we um, put an insurance uh, product in the field. Because we're working, because the pictures that we have is th this are our clients, and most of them they do not have access to any uh, inclusive insurance or or any financial products itself. But my point will go into, and then again, uh, just to make it a strong point is insurance is not a single solution. And when we think about how what we can do as terms of what WFP is doing as anticipatory actions is. Because we know the risks that we're not covering with insurance. Uh, and that flood part is always a question that we have from clients in terms of or from beneficiaries um, from an excess, uh, from an excess rain coverage. It's like, okay, so excess rain is flood coverage? I'm like, no, it's not. But we know that peril. We know the risk that we're not covering. And then we create and we integrate solutions to prepare them into our resilience and anticipatory actions activities so whenever the shock happens, and the insurance might not be triggering uh, for excess rain or drought, or if it's a, if it's a pearl that was not is not covered, then will not trigger because we don't have a pearl. But we prepared them uh, to confront those risks. So my my point will be, we need to teach them as well to the insurance companies to work together with the, with the initiatives that are going into within the countries that organizations, humanitarian sectors are also working, but also as Flavia said, social protection. So those solutions of what the private sector and insurance companies are working with needs to be integrated in these activities, because then we will have a overall 360 degree coverage uh, to prepare them on the coverages or the rest that we're not covering, but also to make them awareness of what are they covered and how can they approach the insurance part. That will be my part. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. You want to ask something? Yeah, I just want to add. Um, I mean, like product information is a case. I mean, uh, last week, I just surprised myself that my health insurance covered some of my dental treatment. So then it's a, that is, I just signed and, and it's again, you know, it's not putting some different groups, but um, what, what is important for us is uh, we are targeting um, mostly unbankable communities. So insurance is, uh, people mostly don't have a bank account. Say so having insurance is, is way beyond of having a bank account. And when we provide the product, as Gina mentioned, like we are developing parametric products where are predefined by, for example, hurricane by 13 kilometers per hour. So people will not get a payout if this not reach. So the most important thing is not to only tell the benefit of the product, but also 
tell, inform the client what is the limitation of the products. Because like wind speed for coconut and banana is different effect, right? So I mean, like uh, this is a. Uh, this kind of a product information is very important to make it clear in the beginning that also one of uh, our lesson learned from 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 a previous phase of the projects thank you Raja. and what we're going to do now is that we're going to pretend that we are in 2030 right so we are in this decade of you know we're about to, to, to achieve the sustainable development goals and i'm, I'm going to ask each of our panelists what is on the horizon for you? How do you, in your sphere of influence, get us or, or, or support your constituents to advance the 2030 agenda? So you're looking at several SDGs that you are responsible for. So what have you done? In other words, what is on the horizon for each of you? How do we win against natural hazards and vulnerabilities? What challenges are you overcoming? What opportunities are you grasping to ensure that our part of, of the world, Latin America and the Caribbean, builds forward stronger and leaves no one behind? There is no order to this wrong. So you can decide as my audience who you want to hear from first, or they can decide for themselves who goes first. So who do you want to hear from first? Maria. Flavia. <laughs> I had a feeling that this was going to happen. Um, so what do we, yeah, but that's a very, very interesting uh, question about the future. So of course, when we're talking about climate hazards, um, we're not, I mean, my, my intervention here is not forgetting that there is, you know, other climate actions that us collectively, government as individuals, companies can take on the adaptation mitigation. But let, let us focus a little bit on dealing with the risk that we still will have to, to deal with from now onwards because we are not able to mitigate or prevent all these climate shocks. And this is where uh, the World Food Program has been following the, 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 the national trends that we see. Um, I'm talking specifically about this region in Latin America and the Caribbean, but not all, not exclusively on using different instruments to not to finance um, um, so, uh, social protection re responses. So one of the examples of something that we've been doing um, in the Caribbean and Central America is supporting the, the governments of Nicaragua and Dominica that I'm not, I think the representatives might even be in this, in this audience. Um, to uh, increase the premium that they buy from a parametric uh, macro insurance, so sovereign insurance, which is CRIF, uh, that we have our panelists here too. And this, um, this, this part of the proportion of the, pay, the, um, the premium that it's bought by WFP um, has to be used um, with the social assistance, national social assistance programs to be activated in case a shock is triggered. So I think that kind of modeling that we have different kinds of financial instruments to fund the shock responsive social protection is what we are looking uh, towards in the future. So together, we you know with regular social protection, with insurance, uh, with the employment sector, we are more able as a society to deal with all those risks um, and, and to respond faster to shocks. The, the, the use of social protection systems is, is particularly important. And with that, I would end because of um, the, the targeting that it, it, it historically has on vulnerability and populations that are in a vulnerable situation. So we all understand that people that are already in a vulnerable situation, like we saw in the video, will be affected in a much higher level by the shock. So it's, it's also safe to assume that um, if they are covered by regular social protection systems uh, and we and there is a shock, this using the same mechanisms would reach them faster. So I think that those instruments that can make uh, the response more effective, the recovery more efficient, and that are able to cover a bit of the the, the financial aspect, right? The the, the cost of uh, answer, to responding to all these different shocks is uh, what we're looking towards in the future. Over. Thank you, Flavio. Um, anyone else would like to go next? We're looking at 2030 
What is on the horizon for each of your organizations? What are you doing to scale up and to support the most vulnerable? So Gina. Okay. Oh. <laughs> well, I think um, it's going to be a little bit similar to what Flavia said. Basically, it's more products, more members, more coverage, you know, in a nutshell. And so we're actively working with other countries in the Caribbean and Central America to get those on board. Um, also even looking at maybe some other regions, um, maybe even in South America. And also providing products that matter or that countries still need. Um, we're looking at a product for drought. We're looking at a product specifically for agriculture. So, you know, developing products that um, potential future members may need. And then in terms of more coverage, of course, more coverage means it costs more. So we are also look, working with donors or continuing to work with donors, you know, to secure resources to assist governments in purchasing more coverage than they already have. Um, so in a nutshell, those are the three things. And then a big thing which underpins all of what CRIF does is partnerships. Partnerships with um, non-governmental organizations, partnerships with regional organizations, to enable us to implement initiatives on the ground. Thank you, Gina. And I think Isabel, you wanted to respond, Isabel? Yes. So our target is continue to apply uh, deep knowledge, technology, climate data, weather forecasts to design a proper risk modeling in order to support the market, but in a sustainable way and in a long term. That is important for us. And the public sector assumes a large portion of risks and often the budgets are under pressure for, for example, emergency response costs, reconstruction of property and infrastructure, or support non-insurance households and so on. And closing the financial gap between the insured and uninsured losses is extremely important for the public sector. And insurance is one of the tools for governments to increase financial resilience. The public sector solutions team of C3, they support the strategy of the group through three pillars. The first one is the public sector expertise, influencing legislation, regulation, related to insurance products, parametric products, and risky transfer. The second one, product expertise, structuring parametric solutions, like mentioned Raja, for earthquake, storms, drought, excess of rain, soil moisture, and so on. And the third one, extended networking, contributing with different types of business unities and divisions. We are partners of institutions like CREF, World Food Program, and other institutions because we believe that the collaboration between the public sector and insurance industry is critical for intensified society resilience to climate risks and is totally aligned with the three mission that is to make the world more resilient. Thank you, Isabel. And Raja? Yeah, I just want to echo the other panelists. So the work, our work, at least we see SDG, we touch upon a few SDGs, right? It's like uh, uh, property reductions and women empowerment and such. And um, the, the challenge of what we want to do until 2030, we see this uh, product availability because the product we are developing mostly very new in the region or in the countries, let's say parametric insulin product is a, the new product in the market and also the access to the product because our target is um, the vulnerable and um, low income. Then how to see that those group of community could access to the product. What kind of innovation we can do? So this is uh, include as well like financing um, sustainability and and how social protection mechanism could be linked. For example, just want to be realistic. We target low income and vulnerables. How can they afford to have insurance? And then what is solutions? Like um, we had at least a very interesting talk in uh, inclusive insurance conference about um, and then of the days the population will knock the ministry doors, give me support. So the government in the end of the day will have a responsible to, to, um, uh, to respond. And um, this is uh, the way how we see also collaboration is very important because we are based in Germany 
And what we are doing is uh, in the, like a region specific, a region specific in the regions, working with organization in the regions like CRIF SPC, local universities, and also look local insurance companies, private sectors who have a market there. There is this uh, opportunity and um, where we are looking forward for the next 2030s. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, when you say 2030, uh, it seems far away, but at the same time, it's so close uh, that a lot of things we need to do and we need to implement. But um, if you ask me, how do I see it or how do we see our interventions and the activities that we're doing in 2030? Well, for me, it will be a more mature risk finance solution market. Um, that, as my colleague said, is with an open access to rural communities. So we will have a more mature uh, finance access, a more mature insurance market, but uh, that will be supported by a complete commitment from governments, from the regulators, but also the private sector. And that part, the, the last part, is something that is important for us into building the right partnerships with the private sector so we can continue then this following years into creating more solutions, as my colleague from CRIP said, um, like creating more solutions, have a, a, a broader market of opportunities and solutions that are more tailored within the rural communities, but also within as a meso and a micro coverage, but also as a macro coverage as well. So um, for me, it's like that. And if you ask me, I will hope that the technology will uh, increase at that time, that we, will, that we are able to, to improve our anticipatory actions in terms of um, um, a more mature and more developed forecast index insurance uh, that will be complemented with a um, after or a normal insurance after event as opposed to event insurance. So that's, that's the future for me and I guess it's something that could be achievable um, but then there's a lot of work that we still need to do in, within the government, uh, the regulators, and the private sector as well. And WFP is committed to it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. I think we're all committed to linking insurance with social protection. And we're all committed, I think, more so as it relates to shock responsive social protection, adaptive social protection. Um, what we'd also like to share with you is a publication that we have on linking social protection with climate resilience and adaptation. And I'm going to throw out a question to the audience. What do you think of the approach of governments allocating through their social protection mechanisms a particular portion? So through social protection, as you know, Governments provide subventions to their ministries of social development, social protection, and within those subventions, those ministries may opt to pull it, put some uh, aside for natural disasters, right? Not natural disasters, any type of disaster-related event. What do you think about governments considering taking a portion of that portion of their subvention and investing it in instruments such as insurance. Because we do know that once there is some kind of natural disaster, persons do knock on the doors of the Ministry of Finance on the Ministries of Social Protection. Can they put aside some resources for that? Would that be an approach that governments can take? Any thoughts on that? I think that's a very sound approach. If depending on the strength of the registry and the strength of the social protection system already in existence. And I think CRIF provides a great example of this and the model can be scaled up to different sectors, the, the coast insurance for fisheries. Um, it, it, encourages resilience in the fishery sector because it, and I don't want to be speaking for Chris, <laughs> sorry. It encourages resilience in the fishery sector because it encourages fisher folk to, to sign up for the registry to formalize the sector if they might have been otherwise unregistered as, as fisher folk. And then the government uh, pays the premium to CRIF 
and then payouts can go directly to the fisher folk themselves as beneficiaries. So like you said, if you're a vulnerable, vulnerable person, would you rather buy a chicken or buy insurance? It's very hard to set aside a portion of your income to purchase insurance. But as a government, you'd much rather pay $10 now for a premium as opposed to $100 in response. So I think it's a cost-effective way for governments to start subsidizing either directly or indirectly these premiums. Thank you, Mary. Any other comments or questions that you may have? Did we miss anything that you would like us to speak about? Is there any panelists that you would like to hear more about? Hi, good afternoon. I would like to hear more about the initiatives you have for sensitization and making persons understand the need for insurances. Because a lot of the time, where you mentioned that, you know, a lot of the times we sign and we don't know why we are signing. And you said that it recently happened to you and it's, you're in the sector. So just picture someone who isn't even in that sector. How are you going? What? plans you have for your future in your future plans to make us understand what we are buying oh my name is darnet and i'm from st vincent and the grenadines i'm mary boyer from the world bank Um, well, one of the things that we're working on with the microinsurance product, and right now it's currently being piloted in five Caribbean countries, um, is very often, you know, insurance companies, they interact with a certain uh, set of clientele. But if we're trying to reach farmers and fishers and certain persons who don't typically have insurance or are not... Um, you know, heavily involved in the banking sector. That's not who they speak with. So we are working with people like the agriculture extension officers, um, the local credit unions and so on, so that they can reach out to our target audience and introduce the concepts, introduce the products and increase understanding that way. So re making sure to involve the persons who the target audience typically trust and, you know, and interact with on a day to day basis. I can share an example that we have here in Brazil. I work in the agriculture team and we have traditionally the traditional product for crops. But parametric, it's not so easy to understand on the farmer level and the superintendents as well. So the insurance company and reinsurance companies sit together with the local superintendents in order to explain how we will create a product that the, God, the farmer will receive something because it seems like I will see a parametric, a trigger, it's, it's not easy. But we need to develop this conversation before the insurance policy, because otherwise it will be a very negative market for this type of product that we try to develop here in Latin America and in Brazil specifically. Just, just to echo again, I think it's a very much market to market, right? Like how the countries work. And just to add, um, like in Fiji, for, for example, um, um, the project worked with the cooperative. And the cooperative, um, like uh, then even they, they helped to, um, to, to buy the product in the group. And the cooperative also helped to, um, to, pay, the pro to pay the premium differently. So I think it's like uh, we see how is this communities in, in the target group, it could be farmers or fishers. So, so for us working with the local um, uh, private companies like the insurance, they have their own network as well. So then it's like a, a credit union, they have their own network. So that is uh, really dependent on every country to target a single farmers to inform the product. Product information is the key. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I have a question. Well, first of all, I wanted to comment on your experience. I think I've experienced also really terrible insurance, but also ones that is easy to understand. And it's usually like digested in a very almost like picture level. Like this is what happens if this happens. And it's like uh, to me, even though I worked in insurance at some point, like that was a much better experience than reading through policies, etc. So I think we're getting to like a more creative way. But my question was not about that. It was sorry. Just wanted to share. There is you can have a positive experience with insurance. Um, 
as a consumer. So I think uh, you mentioned a lot of data on like, I think the modeling side, um, and then we create these contracts for parametric insurance. But then there's the other side, the consumer side. So what kind of data are you tracking after, you know, it's been triggered or after it goes out in terms of how people are using it? Is it satisfying kind of the needs? Is it doing what you intend to do? And how do you iterate? Because iterating on insurance, the trigger, whatever it is, is a lengthy process. So, Oh, my name is Maria Marquita. I work for the World Bank. Thank you, Maria. And I'm going to ask different uh, panelists to respond to that differently from the macro insurance perspective, the sovereign, the micro insurance perspective, and the meso. I'm going to start online. Um, do you want to go Flavia or Jorge? Jorge? And then I'm going to go to Gina and... Yeah, it's a really good question, and um, I'll I will answer that question based on the perspective of WFP. We're not insurance companies, um, but we promote insurance through the design process and everything else. So, um, what we're doing in terms of data, um, we designed the risk finance initiative into microinsurance, but also climate services network and also the anticipatory actions for the climate services network. What we do is we're creating an entire climate um, network, climate data network to monitor and um, being comparing what is perceived at the field in terms of risks or what are the losses within the field and then compare it with the parametric data that we're getting from our insurance. So what we do is when we have that data, because we think that when we just go to the field and start, start to do questions about how do you perceive these risks, then you might get a, a lot of questions that are not data relevant to the reinsurance companies and they will say to us now well we need some scientific data if you're sitting down with us and try to iterate in uh, the design process of insurance so that's one of the initiatives that we're working with so we will have relevant data automatic data that is caught, captured or caught at the field level so we can start changing the conversation and what's the risk perceived versus the risk that is reported by the insurance companies and then what's happening next step after the insurance? Well, WFB is part of experts in this kind of um, monitoring part. We have what we call uh, PDMs, which is a post-disaster monitoring. Uh, we do it for our CVT, which is cash paid transfers uh, initiatives, but we also have a PDM uh, tailored to insurance. So 10 days after we issue a payout, we go to the field and we capture that data over what's happening within that payout. Was the payout relevant? Was the payout covering the risk that you perceived that you suffered? Um, how, are we, how are you using that payout? Are you using it for food? Are you using it for goods, into agriculture goods? Or what's the final destination of that? And when we gather all that data, finishing all this, um, uh, of this monitoring part, what we do is we sit down with the insurance company at the reinsurance company, and we try to teach the insurance company how to do this monitoring. Because let's be realistic. Um, insurance company, they do not do much more of monitoring parts when something happens. They're just doing the monitoring part of other financial KPIs or the financial indicators, but not about like what's happening with the payout itself. So we sit down with the insurance company and the reinsurer as well and try to model at what's happening. If we need to raise that level of the first payout, if the, um, if the payout structure is something that we need to change, if we need to raise the sum insurer as well because we're not reaching and we're not helping them into relevant protection because we can have insurance, but if the protection or the or what we are offering is not relevant of what's happening within the field, then we're not doing nothing. Uh, we're just issuing policies. Um, and that's what we're doing from WFP perspective. But I will give my, the space to my colleagues from the private sector. Hi. Um, okay. Thank you, Jorge. Gina, would you like to add um, from the sovereign level how payouts are monitored and used? Sure. Um, so CRIF requires any recipient government within six months of their receipt of the funds to indicate what they have used the funds for. So the countries are able to use it depending on their particular priorities after an event. Um, there are certain um, environmental conditions that are placed, you know, to make sure that there's not environmentally um, 
detrimental, but really it is up to the countries to decide what their priorities are. And so we require them to report to CRIF, and we also like to make that information public. Um, when CRIF does issue a payout, we make that public, and so it's important, not just for the donors, but for the persons in those countries to understand what the government has used those funds for. Um, so we really believe in transparency in that regard. And um, countries have used it for a variety of uses, you know, repairing roads and bridges, providing medicine and food and so on to affected persons, building materials and so on. So there's a wide range of uses and we monitor it closely after we issue payouts. Um, I think yes, Flavia, I think you want to say something. Yes, I just want to add something quickly um, because uh, um, about data, like the alluding to, to the question. The other advantage of using social protection systems uh, in this sphere, it's because usually uh, countries that have mature and even countries that don't have such mature systems, but it's, it's the, the social protection system is usually surrounded by social registries or some type of registry or database or beneficiaries information. And that can help us um, as well, um, even uh, the government or to some extent, even the private sector, although we, I'm not thinking about an example right now that I can mention with the private sector, but that helps us to focus faster um, the, um, the, the responses, like the different instruments to the people that would be, um, you know, most affected by these different shocks because there is already um, a, a whole system, a whole information system uh, that would allow us to identify them easier. So I just wanted to mention that about data too. Over. Thank you, Flavio. So we've had a number of, you know, perspectives, thoughts, and we have less than one minute before we're thrown off the stage. Does anyone want to just add anything, say anything? before we, we close this discussion. So whilst I'm waiting. Oh. Hi, thank you uh, for the presentation. My name is Kimberly Westby and I'm from the Ministry of Economic Development from Belize. And my question is for CRIF. Perhaps you mentioned it earlier and I missed it, but can you tell us a little bit of the last payout that you did? Uh, perhaps a major payout and what triggered that payout? Um, well, the largest payout, which was a couple of years, uh, 20, was the, for the earthquake in Haiti, you know, so um, our earthquake policy is triggered literally by the amount of ground shaking that the country experiences after an earthquake. And if that um, reaches a certain level, um, what the model does is it calculates the losses that um, are due to that level of ground shaking based on the assets on the ground um, in that particular country. And if those losses are at a certain value, which is greater than the trigger in the policy, which the government selects, then the policy is triggered and they get the payout. So in the case of Haiti, they received the maximum payout under their policy after that Haiti after that event. Um, and so in general, that's how all the CRIF policies work. What was the size of the payout? It was 40 million US dollars. So that's the largest payout that CRIF, four zero, four zero, 40 million US dollars. And as you would imagine, Haiti has received maybe five or six payouts from CRIF since 2007, starting with the very, in the 2010, that other earthquake um, back in 2010, but their coverage was less at that time. Um, and in fact, after that earthquake, they increased the level of coverage because at that time, I think the payout was like $8 million. So not only Haiti, but other countries in the region who are vulnerable to earthquakes, they also increased their earthquake coverage at the time. And I think our country's increasing coverage for tropical cyclone, for rainfall. Right. So each year, even after COVID, even dealing with the COVID pandemic and the economic impacts, um, our member countries increased, um, many of them increased the level of coverage um, that they 
purchase from CRIF. And each year, the level of cov coverage has um, increased. Um, all our members, now it's over a billion dollars in coverage that they have ceded to CRIF. So even within economic constraints, they realize the value of investing in CRIF insurance policies. Thank you, Gina. Oh. Hi, I'm Dulce Durham. I'm from Suriname. I want to know if only flooding is one of the hazards that can um, get paid out or because in Suriname, we our hazards are flooding and strong winds. What about strong winds? Because that is um, a major hazard in Suriname. Interesting that you mentioned that because we are actively trying to get Suriname on board because they're not members yet. And we recognize that flooding in terms of runoff, you know, because you're a large country and you have other neighbors, that is something that you're interested in. It's something that we are working on to be able to offer that to Suriname and Guyana um, and other Central American countries. Um, the tropical cyclone policy does address strong winds, but it's only within a tropical cyclone. So this has come up before where there are instances of strong winds that are not part of, trop of trop tropical cyclones. And we are taking that on board and looking, looking at that. All right. Thank you. Thank you um, to my panel. But thank you for being here this morning, this afternoon. Um, sharing with us, engaging with us, and listening to what we have to say. Um, we're around, so if there are any questions that we didn't get to address on the panel, please feel free to, to come and talk to us. All right, thank you very much.